Welcome to a lecture on morphological processes. In morphological processes, we are talking about processes and changes. Therefore, morphological processes can be defined as the process of changing the form and function of a word to fit a certain context. That is how we define. So the key definition of morphological processes is to fit a certain context, okay? And the context here must always be a linguistic context. Talking about changes means talking about alternations. So far, we are exposed to three kinds of alternation and morphological processes work at the third kind of alternation, phonologically, morphologically, and lexically conditioned alternation. In other words, morphological processes work at the lexical level or at the level of lexicon. There are two types of morphological processes. The first one is assimilation, and the second one is deletion. In assimilation, we focus on substitution, while in deletion, we focus on elimination. Furthermore, assimilation is further divided into two subtypes. The first one is total assimilation, and the second one is partial assimilation. Now, let's see what total assimilation is. Total assimilation occurs when the last consonant of the prefix changes into a phoneme which is identical with the starting phoneme of the next word. Here you are. These are some examples. You can see here that the last consonant of the prefix in is n. When this prefix is followed by another word that is literate, the sound N changes into L. In other words, the sound N is assimilated into L. And the assimilation is total. Why is it total? Because the sound N is changed into L. So the result is degemination, okay, gemination. Therefore, total assimilation is also called gemination process because the result is a double consonant. So illiterate becomes illiterate. The same rule is also applicable when you use in followed by mortal. So the result is not immortal, but the result of this combination is immortal. And also in plus regular, the result is irregular. This is total assimilation. The last consonant of the prefix changes into a phoneme which is identical or similar with the starting phoneme of the next word. The other prefix that also experiences total assimilation is at. Okay, at is assimilated whenever at is followed by the other words which are initialized by consonants. For example, when at is followed by a word which is initialized by er consonant, and then the final sound of the prefix that is de changes into the initial sound. So it becomes er. And you can see here that we have double er, or this is gemination. We also have here gemination of er. The same 
rule is, so, is also applicable when add is followed by F sound. Add plus fact becomes a fact. Add plus cues becomes a cues. So we can say that total assimilation results in gemination. What is gemination? Gemination can be understood as double consonant. However, this rule is not applicable when the word that comes after is initialized by J, M, and V. So the rule is not applicable when at when prefix at is followed by three consonants, J, M, V. So we can find in English the words such as adjacent, adjunct, adjunct, and then admire, admit, adverb, advice, and so on. Okay, so add is assimilated whenever it is followed by a consonant, except three consonants, J, M, and V. Now, the other type of assimilation is partial assimilation. In partial assimilation, the sound is not changed into the sound which is identical, but the sound is changed into another from the set of phonemes articulated on the same place of articulation. So we change the sound into the set of phonemes which are located in the same of articulation, in the same place of articulation. Now, there are two kinds of partial assimilation. The first one, we can call it labial assimilation. Labial assimilation means prefer labials before labials. So you can see here in the examples, in plus possible, and here the sound N is followed by P. And you see that is not that N is not labial sound, but P is a labial sound. So the, the rule or the process says, prefer labials before labials. So N here is changed into a labial sound, which is located in the same place of articulation. So N here is not changed into P. When N is changed into P, the process is called total assimilation. But here it changes into the phoneme which shares the same place of articulation with P. What is it? We choose M. So N here does not become P, but N here becomes M, and the result is impossible. And also here, N plus body, you can see that N is not a labial sound, but B here is a labial sound. So and here is change into the labial sound becomes M. And then N plus body does not result in N body, but M body. The same rule is also applicable in N plus power. So you have here M power. There are many instances in English where you can find such labial assimilation. Okay. The next type of partial assimilation is voicing assimilation. If in labial assimilation, we can say prefer labials before labials, and this one in voicing assimilation, we can say prefer voiceless before voiceless. Okay, prefer voiceless before voiceless. What does it imply? It implies that the sound which is not voiceless, okay, is changed into voiceless, okay? 
Let's see some examples. The first one here, five plus th, okay? Five plus th. And you know that th is a voiceless consonant. Th is a voiceless consonant. So whenever five ends in sound V, which is voice. So the sound V is changed into a voiceless, which has the same place of articulation. And you see that V is in the same articulation or in the same place of articulation with F. So V is changed into F. So five plus th becomes fifth, not fifth, but fifth. The second one, you can see here, the last sound of this scribe is b, and then it is followed by the other, the other, uh, the other suffix, which is in, initialized by voiceless sound is sh, describe plus sh. So sh is a voiceless, and then b is changed into voiceless. Okay, what is the sound? What is the voiceless sound which has the same place of articulation with b? Okay, that is p. So b is changed into p. So the result here is not description, but it becomes description. The next one, let's see syntax, okay? And this word is followed by suffix S. And you know that S here does not indicate plural or this is not a plural marker, but this belongs to a derivational morpheme, which means science. So when syntax plus S, okay? And then, G here is voice. So G is voice, is changed into voiceless. What is the sound which share similar place of articulation with S? Uh, sorry, with G, that is K. So the result is syntax. So you can see the process is like this. Syn plus tag plus S, it becomes syntax, and then g is changed into the sound which share similar place of articulation with g, that is k, we have here syntax, but k as is not popular in English, uh, especially in English, uh, you know, uh, in English uh, spelling, so K as here is changed into X. So this is the result of syntax. So syntax actually is unique. Why? Because syntax is a kind of discipline that is, or, or it is a branch of linguistics. Usually a kind of discipline is ended in logic, for example. Yeah, such as phonology, morphology, but syntax ends in X. Uh, so you can find that actually X here comes from S, okay? When S here uh, follows, okay, the, uh, the word which ends in voice and then that voice is changed into voiceless. Therefore, syntax becomes syntax and this one is replaced by the spelling X. So we have syntax, that is partial assimilation. So you can compare between total assimilation and partial assimilation. In total assimilation, the final sound is changed into the sound which is identical with the initial sound that comes after. However, in partial assimilation, the change is not result in identical sound, but in sound which has similarity in terms of place of articulation. Okay, so this is partial assimilation in the form of 
voicing assimilation. Now let's come to dilation. You know, dilation means elimination. We delay, we eliminate the sound, we reduce the sound. So dilation, in dilation, one phoneme is dropped from the original morpheme and its phonological content is altered. That is dilation. So one phoneme is dropped from the original morpheme. And of course, you know, its phonological content is altered. Okay, here you are. There are some examples. The first one here is up plus moral. You can see here that up indicates negative. And when it is followed by moral, it doesn't become a moral or it doesn't result in up moral, but it result in a moral. Op plus mid, it becomes omit. And then X plus sample becomes example. You can see here that X plus sample, we omit S here. We omit S. And usually, okay, usually the omission takes place when the last sound of the prefix share similarity with the initial sound that comes after. So B and M have similarities in terms of place of articulation. Both of them are bilabial consonants, okay? And also X. X here actually uh, means S dilation. Why? Because X is spelled K S. So the second S is dilated. Therefore, we only have here example. Okay, that's all about morphological processes. Remember that morphological processes work at the lexical level. It means that we create a new lexicon. Okay, that is where the morphological processes work. Morphological processes are divided into two. The first one is assimilation and the second one is dilation. Remember, assimilation is related to alternation or we can say substitution. On the other hand, dilation is related to elimination. Okay, I hope you can understand this explanation and you can read some more references in order to give you more understanding of morphological processes. Thank you and goodbye.